The last uh, subject that we want to discuss in our treatment of random processes is the modeling of additive white Gaussian noise. So additive white Gaussian noise is a random process and we're going to discuss uh, first of all, noise is a random process. Then we're going to discuss why we call it Gaussian noise and why we call it additive white Gaussian noise. So we're going to go through this particular example of a random process, which is an extremely important example and one that we see over and over again. And we'll discuss its properties. So random, uh, excuse me, additive white Gaussian noise, again, covered in the first chapter of our textbook from Sklar uh, in the section on random processes. So a lot of the examples that I've been showing you, traces that I've been showing you, are examples that come from additive white Gaussian noise, which is zero mean. So in particular, because it is Gaussian, all of the marginal uh, probability density functions of this uh, noise are Gaussian. So here is the PN. So if I sample this at any instant in time, any time at all, I'm going to get a noise sample. And that noise sample is going to have a, a, a distribution which is Gaussian. So this is the PDF for Gaussian. Uh, and of course, sigma squared represents the variance. And in this case, it's zero mean. So additive white Gaussian noise is a process which is zero mean. And it has a certain variance which is the same no matter when I sample it. So this is one where all of the marginals are identical, right? Uh, identical um, uh, densities. So that is our first description of additive white Gaussian noise. It's a random process. When we sample it, it always gives us the same distribution, Gaussian, zero mean, with the same uh, variance. Now, in addition, the white part of additive white Gaussian noise comes from the assumption that all of the um, samples that we have are independent, completely independent. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Because we say it's Gaussian, we can actually be a little weaker in our statement. We can say that all of the samples are uncorrelated. When they're uncorrelated, what's the definition of uncorrelated random variables? Well, if I have a random variable n of t, I sample it a certain, certain amount of time, a certain instant of time, and then tau seconds later, I sample it again. So now I look at the, the expected value of the product of this. Well, when they're uncorrelated, this is zero. This expectation is zero. Of course, the only time it won't be zero is when tau is equal to zero. Because if I have n of t squared, the expected value of that, well, for sure, you know, that's uh, positive. It's not zero. But any other value, any other value, I'm going to get zero. So I don't know what this is, but I know for anything else, it's zero. And so one way that we can talk about random processes is that we say that this uh, property of being uncorrelated means that their expected value is something like a delta function, right? That um, uh, for all values of tau which are not zero, it is zero. Now, uncorrelated in uh, random uh, variables, two random variables which are uncorrelated, normally you cannot say that they're independent. Normally that's not possible. However, there are a few densities that have the property that uncorrelated implies independence. And Gaussian distribution is one of the examples where if I have two uncorrelated Gaussian random variables, that means that those two random variables are independent. And again, that's not generally true, but for Gaussians for sure it's true. So that means if I want to look at the joint density function for this pair, n of t, n sampled at time t, n sampled uh, tau uh, seconds, well, any two points, n1 and n2, because they're independent, the joint density function is super simple. The joint density function is just the product of the marginals. So as long as I know the marginal density for each one of these, n1 and n2, I know the joint one. So that means that I know here it's Gaussian, here it's Gaussian, so it's just the product of these uh, two Gaussian PDFs. That's the joint PDF. So I said so earlier, just on a previous slide, that the autocorrelation function was a function only of the lag and that it was the uh, delta function. If they were exactly aligned up, of course, it was uh, not zero. But for any lag at all, the noise is completely uncorrelated. 
So high noise at one instant of time. Next instant of time could be little. It could be large. They're independent, completely independent. It doesn't matter how much, how little the interval is, any little interval to the side. All, all <clears throat> could be anything. So I'm going to just put a factor before that to uh, quantify you know, what happens when it's zero, right? I've got to have some way of normalizing it. So I'm going to call that n0 over 2. Um, so this represents uh, somehow the noise power. So we know that the Fourier transform pair of this uh, autocorrelation function, that will give us the power spectral density. So we're looking for the power spectral density of added void Gaussian noise. Now, I look up in a Fourier table of Fourier transforms, delta function, and what I find is it's a constant. So that means that if I were to do a plot of the power spectral density, what is power spectral density? Well, here's F, and I want to know what is the, the G of F <clears throat> for a certain frequency. And of course, uh, the answer is that it's just constant. It's one level, N0 over 2. So that means that no matter what the frequency is, the amount of energy, distrib the distribution across frequencies is exactly the same for every frequency. If it's low frequency, if it's high frequency, the, the power is somehow the same for all of those frequencies. And that's where we get the name of white. Why do we call it white Gaussian noise? It's called white Gaussian noise because this density function, was, uh, sorry, the um, autocorrelation function is a delta function. And when it's a delta function, that means that the Fourier transform is a constant, which means that all frequencies are present. White light is a light where all frequencies are present. All frequencies are present, so we use that word, that uh, adjective, to also describe uh, the noise and the Gaussian noise. So it's Gaussian because the distribution is Gaussian. It's white because of this delta function, which gives us in the frequency domain um, a flat uh, power spectral density. So if the power spectral density of uh, noise is, is quite simple, it's flat, uh, let's think about the implication perhaps for a output of a system where you have filtered uh, noise. So now the idea is to take this uh, completely uh, independent noise and you put it through some filter. So a filter, for, ha for instance, could be a low-pass filter, but really it could be any filter. H represents the uh, frequency response of the filter that I'm using to filter the noise. So there is this result that says the power spectral density, the output of a linear time invariant system, is just the uh, frequency response module squared times the input power spectral density. Get, that gives you the output. Now let's assume that the input density here is additive white Gaussian noise, so it's completely constant. Well, once it goes through this filter, that will no longer be the case. It will, if the filter has, goes to zero, like a low-pass filter, goes to zero for high frequencies, that means there'll be no noise in those high frequencies. So there'll be noise in the lower frequencies, and so, so it'll still be Gaussian because filtering is a linear operation. And when I do a linear operation on a Gaussian random variable, I, I get back a Gaussian random variable. So it'll still be Gaussian, but at the output now, it'll no longer be white. Because, of course, if I were to take the inverse uh, Fourier transform, uh, it would, um, uh, this is a rectangle um, now, instead of being flat. And when I take the inverse of a rectangle, of course, I'm going to get a, a sink function in the time domain. And so it'll no longer uh, be this delta function in the time domain. So we call that colored noise. So you can have white noise, which is unfiltered, Gaussian noise, additive white Gaussian noise, and colored noise, which happens, for example, when I filter because I'm cutting off some frequencies or, or modifying the frequency content. It's no longer flat. So the flatness is what gives us uh, white noise, and if it's no longer flat, it's still Gaussian, but it becomes colored noise. For instance, as I mentioned in this example, if I cut it with a low-pass filter, and so it's a rectangle in the um, frequency domain. If I went back in the time domain, I'd actually have uh, a sync function. So this is important because it's a better model, maybe a more realistic model for noise. Because what happens when I had this idea of additive white Gaussian noise? 
Here was a frequency domain, and I had a nice flat power spectral density. And this was N0 over 2. And it's the density, right? So what if I said, what was the power of the noise? You can't read it, but I wrote power. So it's the power of the noise. Well, that's easy. It's the area under the curve, right? But the power here, it's infinite. What kind of model is this? You tell me it's a good model for noise, but it's going to be infinite power. And it's OK, because it's our model. but. Noise is never like not filtered <laughs> because I'm going to measure it, right? I'm going to have a circuit where I, I look at what's you know the output of the noise, and it's always, always filtered, always filtered. So this is a nice mathematical model, but of course when we are looking at real systems, uh, real systems, they're going to um, have some frequency cutoff because my, my system can't measure infinite frequencies. So I would never, even if this was true, I would never see it. So that's okay if it's if this, this, this kind of weird thing going on with the power. So of course if I take the area under the curve of a sync function, it's very well behaved. I'm going to get a nice finite power for the contribution of power from my, my filtered circuit. Of course, um, we're going to do analysis and we're going to talk about random variables. And we're still going to assume that the random variables are independent. And then it's kind of an okay thing to do because if we look at this sync function, there are points where the um, autocorrelation passes for zero. And of course, at all of those points, they'll be uncorrelated and independent. So, um, so it's still the properties that we'll call upon when we do our analysis. The last comment I'd like to make about additive white Gaussian noise is actually um, a reference back to our definition of, of different bandwidths, different definitions of bandwidth. Uh, we had one definition which is called noise equivalent bandwidth. And I think now we have an understanding of where this, this term comes from. Because uh, we said, suppose that the um, frequency response that we were interested in, you know, looked like this. That's our H of F. And I'm trying to define what's a bandwidth for this frequency response. I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a box. I'm going to draw a box with the same height, so I still have it A, and then I want the area under the curve to be the same. So imagine that I have additive white Gaussian noise, and I put it through this filter, which is H of F. Well, then the power, the noise power that I would observe well, that would be the area under this curve. So now imagine that I had the noise was additive white Gaussian noise, and now I pass it through a rectangle. So if I want to know how wide would that rectangle be in order to get exactly the same noise power, if I wanted these two powers to be equal, well, how wide would that rectangle be? And that's exactly what we have here. We said that, well, finally, it's like uh, I had a rectangular one that was letting through the noise. So it's just the reason we have this, this name for this kind of bandwidth measure.